You ready? Yeah. Okay. Hi, my name is Shay Costner. Um, my topic this year in ISM is chemical engineering. Um, my quote for this year is, the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. Um, and I like this quote because um, I like serving others and I also like, um, like science and engineering. So I think that chemical engineering is a good way for me to combine um, like science with helping other people because chemical engineering um, benefits a lot of people in all different types of industries. Um, about me, um, I go to Young Life, I do CrossFit, um, I play the ukulele, I love animals, and I love being outside. Um, so chemical engineering by definition is improving the efficiency or safety of chemical processes. Um, so it's the application of science and math and engineering principles um, into the production and manufacture um, of sometimes they make raw materials and other times um, it's applying those raw materials to like larger products or systems. Um, and the reason I like chemical engineering is because it has such a big variety of applications. Um, there's so many industries that utilize chemical engineers that um, I'm very confident that I'm going to find a specific pathway that I really, really enjoy um, that I'm passionate about and that's important for me um, to have a job that I really look forward to. Um, so my research assessments this year, I did a career outlook assessment um, and I learned that chemical engineering is a mainly male dominated field um, and it's becoming more biology dependent so that was good to know so I can take um, more biology classes in college and that experience is really crucial so that internships are um, a must. A lot of the people I talked to said that college just gives you the tools that you need to be a good chemical engineer but it's a lot of on the job learning and you just um, use your own problem, problem solving skills to apply those tools to your um, to your job. Um, my second or my first research assessment was why material science should be included in high school chemistry cur curriculum. So it was a um, like an overview of a conference that a lot of college professors went to, and they were talking about um, how material science is becoming a more emerging field in chemistry, and that it should be involved in uh, high school curriculums, which was interesting to me because I take AP chemistry. So um, of course, I want to have the best class possible to benefit me in college. Um, and my second research assessment was about how protein extracted from mushrooms to replace sugars and fats in processed foods. So they take these proteins called hydrophobins and they can be used to like replicate the fats in foods like chips and sweets and candy and stuff. And it uh, replicates the texture, but doesn't have the same um, like unhealthy parts that sugars have. So I'm sure it's a long way from being available to the public, but it was just a cool, cool example of how chemical engineering can be really beneficial to people. And then my interview, my first interview was with Kristen Barrett, and she was a mechanical slash petroleum engineer at Denbury, and she was in charge of opening new offshore facilities. Uh, it was interesting to talk to her, especially uh, being a woman in the petroleum field. It's a very male-dominated field, even more so than just chemical engineering in general. So it was good to hear her say that after she um, got involved in the field and the men started to respect her after they saw that she was just as capable as they were. My second interview was with Kayla Teague. She's an environmental chemist at AECOM. Um, and she's in charge of evaluating data that they get from like soil and air and water samples from um, from like their places that they're involved in. So they, she looks at these um, like levels of chemicals that are in the sample and decides based on the state mandate if the chemicals like if the levels are too high. Um, and if they are too high, then she devises a way to um, to like make them lower and to make them fit within the state standards. And then my next interview is with Dr. Ronald Smaldone. Uh, he's a chemistry professor at UT Dallas, and he leads a team of grad students that research organic compounds. And I got to sit in on one of their research meetings. It was very interesting to see um, how closely he worked with his grad students and just got to see what, um, like what kind of things grad students do in a lab, because um, I want to go to grad school. My next interview is with Jarrett Palanez. He's a toxicologist at US Health Group, and he supervises a lab that analyzes urine samples. Um, so. A lot of doctors from across the country will send in uh, the urine samples of patients that are taking usually really high dosage pain medicines. And so they look at these uh, samples to make sure that the body is like breaking down the medicine, using it properly, and also to make sure that the patients are using uh, the correct dosage of the medicine and not taking too much or too little. And my next interview is with Brandon Nelson. He's a food scientist at Daisy Brand Sour Cream, and he manages a lab that improves the shelf life and production of sour cream which was really interesting because I, uh, my dad's a chef, so I've always been really interested in food in the restaurant industry, so it was really cool to see how chemical engineering can be applied to that. Um, my next interview was with Kathy Payne, she's a chemical engineer at Authentics, which is a company that puts chemical markers in oil to prevent counterfeit, so every company 
um, has a different marker that goes in all their oil, and they will go out and uh, send people out to take samples from different um, gas stations across the country, and they'll make sure that uh, the company is using the oil that they're meant to be using by checking to make sure that the marker's in that oil. Uh, my next interview is a Jim Foreman. He's a materials scientist at Raytheon, and he's in charge of developing new materials, um, specifically electromagnetic materials. And that was really interesting because I'm, um, I'm interested in the defense field. And my next interview is with Mary Heifner. She's a chemical engineer at Raytheon, um, and she's in charge of a lab, about 200 people, that make the circuit cards for a large variety of different military systems. Um, and she's my mentor right now. And my last interview was with Christy Gomez. She's a biochemist at Mary Kay, and so her team tests the safety of new skin products, specifically face products, and so they test um, like irritation or redness, swelling, um, and the way that the new products will affect tissue, uh, just to make sure that they're safe, and they also test the way it affects tissue um, in like different parts of the body, such as your lungs, so it's cool to see all the different safety standards that go into um, new makeup. And for my original work, I decided that I was going to research drone planes and their use in targeted killings of terrorists um, because my mentor is in charge of a lab that makes circuit cards for a lot of different things, but also drone planes. Um, and it's just something I'm interested in. It's a very controversial topic um, because it has a big effect on civilians and foreign relations. Um, and it's also kind of controversial over, well, um, over whether it's legal under international law. Um, so my original work is over targeted killings and the use of drone planes in that practice. So a little bit of history about drone planes. Um, they were used in the Balkan War for recon missions as well as in both world wars. Um, mostly just for like surveillance, but there's early uses of using hot air balloons to drop bombs, which would be considered an early use of the UAV, which is unmanned aer aerial vehicle, but obviously nothing really compared to the modern drones that we have today. Um, so following 9-11, Drones improved a lot because that was um, when the war on terror began. And the first targeted killing was in 2002 in Yemen. Um, and following that, the use just continued to escalate um, in the Middle East. So about drone planes, they can be used for surveillance missions or armed with weapons. Um, and the takeoffs and landings are usually coordinated by someone on site. But after that, control can be passed over to someone um, thousands of miles away. Uh, the Creech Air Force Base in Las Vegas is a very popular place for drone pilots to fly. Um, so there's a pilot and operator to control the cameras and sensors of the plane, um, and someone to communicate with ground forces if the drone is working with um, soldiers in the country. So there's different types of drones. There's many tactical and strategic, and I mainly looked at the strategic drones, which are the large ones that are comparable to a, the size of a fighter jet, and those are the ones that are usually armed with weapons and used in targeted killings. So. The Predator is the first one that was developed. Um, it was first used in 1995 for surveillance, um, and it carries two Hellfire missiles. It's roughly $5 million. Um, and then the Reaper is the faster and more, um, more updated version of the Predator. It was first used in 2007, and it's used to carry out the kill chain, which is find, fix, target, execute, execute assess. Um, so this is what is mainly used against terrorists uh, in targeted killings, and it carries a lot more weapons than the Predator, um, and it can carry Hellfire missiles as well as um, Paveway and others. And it costs about $12 million, so it's uh, a lot more expensive than the Predator. Um, this is a Hellfire missile that is used um, in a lot of cases. So they're very, they're pretty accurate. They can be either laser or radar guided. So if it's laser, laser guided, then the firing system, in this case the drone, will point a laser beam at the target, and you have to keep the laser on the target until the missile finds its target, which can be kind of dangerous if you're in an area where there's a lot of enemies around. So um, better than that is the radar guidance. So the drone plane will give the missile, has, it has its own like guidance system in it, so it will give the missile the radar information, and the missile can self-guide itself to the target, um, which is good. It's like a fire and forget is what it's called, so that the launching platform can leave and get out of danger immediately. Um, I don't know if it'll let me click, but this is a um, Hellfire missile strike against an alleged Taliban member. Should I click? Oh. Is it a YouTube video? I don't know. Okay, well, I'll just skip this. <laughs> okay. Um, 
And these are just some more of the weapons that are used in drone planes. Um, so drone planes have a lot of different cameras and sensors. They have black and white cameras and image intensifiers, which makes the image brighter, uh, radar, infrared imaging, and lasers. And they use the satellites to um, relay the information to the pilots. Um, and the image on the bottom is a picture of infrared imaging. So it's um, like heat. Um, so you can see you know, like living targets, um, particularly at night, which is very helpful. So the current situation with targeted killings, um, the pros are that it can be flown for a longer time than a manned aircraft. Um, it's a lot cheaper, and there's no danger to the aircraft crew or ground troops because um, there's no one in the area where the attacks are taking place. Cons are civilian casualties, um, the ethics of extrajudicial killings, which is killing without due process of law, and it puts strains on foreign relations um, in particular cases. So under the Obama administration, drone strikes have increased a lot, even though Obama claims to prefer capture of a killing in regards to terrorists. Um, but the U.S. has a really good intelligence system, so um, capture is not really a top priority because there's already a lot of intelligence without having to interrogate terrorists. Um, the U.S. has about 8,000 drones, but not all of them are predators or reapers. A lot of them are just the smaller ones that are used for surveillance. And uh, it was really difficult to find information regarding um, the number of casualties in drone strikes, but there's an estimated 2,500 to 3,000 people, including militants and civilians, killed in drone strikes in the last 10 years. Um, and Obama has publicly said that the targeted killings are tricky and making decisions is difficult um, because there are a lot of times there's a lot of collateral damage. Um, so Forum Hodge's response to targeted killings has been um, mostly negative. Um, the civilians seem to, um, a lot of times they're being told by Taliban and Al-Qaeda members that they're being targeted by drone strikes, which is obviously not true, but it's easy to believe for them because um, a lot of times, you know, the missiles just come out of nowhere and will destroy homes and families. And so um, there's a lot of hate towards American government due to these strikes. Um, only 17% of Pakistanis support drone strikes against terrorist leaders. Um, and there's a quote. Um, from a military leader in Afghanistan. He said, the resentment created by American use of unmanned strikes is much greater than the average American appreciates. They're hated on a visceral level, even by people who've never seen one or the effects of one. So um, the drone strikes have been really, really negative in terms of um, the way civilians feel about America. However, on the flip side, 65% of Americans support targeted killings, but only 49% are following the news very closely. So a lot of Americans um, are not really informed about drone strikes, but seem to support them. Um, and it makes it easier for the government to use it because if American troops were to, uh, there would be casualties in American troops capturing um, a mid-level terrorist when drones could have been used, there would be a lot of public outcry. Um, so it just makes it easier on politicians to use drones and not put American lives in danger. Um, some high-profile killings by drones. Um, Anwar al Aki was a U.S. citizen. He was the first U.S. citizen targeted by drone strike. Um, he lived in Virginia and he was um, allegedly a part of Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, this was very controversial because he was a U.S. citizen and people argued that his constitutional right of due process was violated um, by this targeted killing. And then about a month after, his son, who's only 16 years old and also an, a U.S. citizen with no connection to terrorism, was killed in a separate drone strike. Um, and the government said that it was a mistake and wasn't meant to happen. However, the intended target was not um, present at this strike. so. Uh, this was a very controversial strike, and human rights groups were questioning why an American citizen was killed in a country that the U.S. is not officially at war with. Um, and then a couple more. Um, just a lot of um, times, uh, it's difficult to decide whether the situation, um, like whether the civilian casualties will outweigh the, um, like the militants killed. So there's a lot of situations where uh, militants and civilians were both killed, um, and drones were also used in the raid on Osama bin Laden's compound. They uh, did a lot of surveillance leading up to it, and they're also present um, providing air support when the Navy SEALs uh, conducted the raid. And Pakistan called this an act of war, and so people were arguing whether this kind of infringed on their sovereignty. Um, so the ethics of using, targeted, or of using drones to conduct targeted killings. Um, so it makes it easy for politicians to justify a war because they don't have to worry about American citizens being angry um, at the deaths of soldiers. And um, the U.S. kind of already has difficult relations with Pakistan, Afghanistan, Yemen, and Somalia, which are the main countries where these strikes are taking place. 
And there's a region in Pakistan, it's northwest, it's the like tribal area, which is where many terrorists are known to live and hide in. And it's very difficult for the Pakistani government to control these areas, so um, that's a bit of a justi justification by the American government that um, like Pakistan isn't taking the necessary precautions to prevent these terrorists from um, like making plans. So here's a map of the areas where targets are taking place, mostly um, Yemen, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Somalia, which you can see are um, around the Arabian Peninsula. And then there's a map of Afghanistan. You can see the northwest area or the tribal area is that's um, very like lawless and difficult to control. Um, so the effect of targeted killings on drone pilots, um, it can make it difficult for pilots to kind of differentiate between real life and kind of a video game scenario because they're not specifically there and they're just seeing the images on a screen. Um, so, but also drone pilots are highly trained, they're professionals, and they've also been known to suffer from PTSD, so it's difficult to decide um, whether it has a positive or negative effect on drone pilots. Um, the effect on civilians, Bureau of Investigative Journalism reports that 400, um, between 400 and 950 civilians have been killed in Pakistan alone. Um, and there's been more civilian casualties in Afghanistan, but those are even more secretive. So another source says that um, a grand total of 2,200 um, in all countries in the last decade um, of civilians killed. So um, as Civilian <laughs> said, before this drone era, we were all very happy. But after these drone attacks, a lot of people are victims and have lost members of their family. A lot of them, they have mental illnesses. So despite the positive effects that drone planes can have on killing terrorists, it also has a really negative impact on the citizens living in these countries. Um, so domestically, the justification for targeted killings is the 2001 authorization for the use of military force, which empowers the president to take all necessary actions in pursuit of those directly responsible for the 9-11 attacks. Um, but this is kind of out of date because it was uh, put into practice right after 9-11, but um, that's you know, a long time ago. And it gives permission to use force for those directly responsible for 9-11 and not just any associated forces. <laughs> Um, and targeted killings are a form of extrajudicial execution, which is carried out due process, so that can be very controversial. Um, under the UN, uh, Article 51 provides UN members to the right to self-defense. However, the country has to be unwilling or unable to prevent the use of its territory for such attacks. So it's kind of um, under debate whether these countries are taking um, the proper precautions against terrorists, whether they're not. Um, under international humanitarian law, civilians should not be targeted, and uh, first responders to a scene can't be targeted, which is difficult because a lot of drones will send in the first strike and then circle around and drop a second strike, which it would be illegal um, if people came to the site and then were uh, fired at again. Uh, and that's if it would be considered armed conflict. Um, and if it's not considered armed conflict with the country, then it would be international human rights law which permits the intentional use of lethal, lethal force only when strictly necessary and proportionate. And it's difficult to justify that um, when these strikes are premeditated because um, there's not an immediate threat to life. Um, under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, um, citizens are given the right to peaceful assembly and the right to freedom of association. A lot of civilians have talked about how they're afraid to gather in like large groups in public places because those groups have been targeted by drone strikes, so that kind of infringes on the right to peaceful assembly. Um, so current protocol, um, the CIA has a kill list, but however, not all the drone strikes are used with a kill list. There's signature strikes um, in which they just see a group of suspected terrorists and will fire on them. Um, Obama has created a disposition matrix, which is um, kind of decides how they're going to deal with a suspected terrorist. Um, this isn't official, this is just kind of um, what the media kind of thinks it would be because it's not public information. Um, and so for my original work, I proposed a protocol for how to decide whether a targeted killing should be carried out or not. So I propose that they eradicate or update the 2001 authorization for use of military force just because it's out of date, um, require warrants for most targeted strikes unless the target is extremely time sensitive and report all strikes to the UN Security Council, which is listed under Article 51. It says measures taken by members and the exercise of their rights to self-defense must be immediately reported to the Security Council. Um, an attempt to sort of make an agreement with the country where the target strike is taking place before striking. Because um, a lot of times the US is trying to work with these countries, even though doing 
um, things kind of without their knowledge is putting those relationships a bit um, at risk. And the U.S. government should make strikes more transparent, accurately report civilian casualties, as well as providing compensation for civilians uh, if they're injured in an attack or to their families if they're killed. Thank you.